Length of two 747s. This monster machine beats at the heart of Britain's recycling industry. This is the biggest shredder in the world. And it faces a world-class challenge. A giant freighter powers towards the docks. But it can't stay long. This ship must leave in 72 hours. Complete with 27,500 tonnes of top quality metal splinters. Created by the shredder. Producing the payload fast enough will push this industrial giant to its limits. Every month, over 4,000 lorries and almost 200 rail carriages arrive at these gates, laden with unwanted metal. Bales of rubbish containing remnants of everyday objects and household goods, once prized possessions in our homes. This is the flagship center of the Sims Group one of the biggest recycling companies in the world. Operating over 120 sites and recycling over 9 million tonnes of waste metal every year. These refined nuggets of shiny rubbish are one of the most environmentally friendly products on the planet. On a daily basis through here, we're looking at uh, around about two, two and a half, sometimes up to 3,000 tonnes per day of various materials. The energy saved from using our product is enough to power 700,000 homes per annum. That's our company alone in the UK. That's enough energy to power the homes in a city the size of Birmingham, England. Crucial to this operation is the world's biggest shredder. This massive machine took 18 months to build and cost $12 million. It is only two years old and already on solid food. A 560 ton giant of heavy industry the shredder smashes 350 tons of metal to pulp every hour. The power from this industrial titan fires shockwaves across the entire site. It's like being hit by an earthquake. I mean, I've got the world's largest shredder behind me, which is chewing cars up at the rate of 450 an hour. The moment the shredder turns on, the whole site starts to shake. Even once up to speed, you can still feel the tremors coming from the hammer mill as it smashes and grinds the metal inside it. Miles Pilkington has more than a passing passion for this mega machine. As one of Sims' senior managers, he has a real stake in its operation. The shredder makes money. It handles some 20% of Sims UK's entire volume. Any unscheduled downtime hits hard on the company's balance sheet. The shredder can't go wrong. It's all to do with volumes. When it comes down to it, it's a margin business. We process material and then we try to sell it and it's about reducing your operating costs as much as possible so you can buy it at the right market price and then sell it at the right market price to make as much profit as you can. And one of the advantages of a big shredder is it handles so much volume in such a cheap and efficient way.
Every year, UK households throw away the equivalent of three and a half million double-decker buses. That's almost 30 million tons of waste. Kitchen goods and computers are replaced more often. And over two million cars are scrapped. 75% of this rubbish can be recycled, but much less than this actually is. An ever-growing proportion of this waste is metal, and huge quantities of this shiny scrap arrive at this Newport recycling centre, where it gets smashed to pieces by the mega shredder. We call it fragmentizing. It's actually what they call a fragmentizer. So what happens? You've got a big hammer spinning round on, on a thing, and you've got a load of grids then. So the scrap goes into the mill, the hammers come round, smash it, and eventually force it to a set of grids. And once they fall out the grids, it's, it's, the material is separated out. Newport is the third largest city in Wales, sitting on the southern estuary of the 350 kilometer long River Severn. A long-standing hub for heavy trade. This was once the gateway for the coal and steel making industries. Today, Newport's docks provide a link between this mighty recycling plant and a world that's embracing a greener way of life. Lorries stream through the gates of this recycling center full of scrap. While ships line up along the docks to take the processed metal away. Richard Morgan makes sure this flow runs smoothly. We frequently do small short sea ships as we call them which load up to about three, three and a half thousand ton. And we on average do about four to five per month. They can come in and out on, uh, on one tide so that's a 12 hour turnaround. But every six weeks, his job gets much tougher. Customers across the world need fragmentized metal to keep their furnaces melting at full capacity. But shipping small amounts of recycled metal across large distances is uneconomical. They need huge quantities. These massive quantities demand an enormous ship. Richard gets 16 days notice of these impending mega ships, and he's expecting one in a few days. But he has seen an unusually high throughput of short sea vessels this month. It has eaten into his stockpiles. It's Thursday, and the giant 30,000 ton cargo ship, Evdoxia, has offloaded a cargo of sugar in London. She will arrive in Newport on Sunday. Her payload must be ready. Huge piles of metal glimmer along the dockside, but much more is needed. The Evdoxia can't leave with less than 27,500 tonnes and still deliver a profit. But producing the freight is only half the battle. To maximise this profit, she must load and depart within a 72-hour window. It's the fastest turnaround possible, and it is time to synchronise with Newport's high tides. There is no margin for error, and the stakes are high. It costs thousands of dollars to operate this ship, so if she sits idle for any length of time, someone has to pay the penalty. It's a tough task, but an unexpected series of events is about to make it a whole lot harder. Only the Mega Shredder has the capacity to reduce such vast quantities of heavy metal to splinters in time for this ship. 
but it means working at its limits. It may be a risk too far. The shredder is a might of modern engineering. Spanning 150 meters end to end, it destroys lorry loads of heavy metal in moments. But it doesn't operate alone. Underneath the hefty shell of this industrial beast is a human crew. On the shredder, we have three people on the infeed. There's two driving the infeed machines, which are throwing the scrap onto the infeed belt. Another man stays on the floor inspecting the, the material which is delivered. We have then got a, a Cat 972 driver who drives around emptying the bays out and moving the steel round. We have then, in the picking shed, we have ten pickers who are actually picking off the dirt out of the frag and the copper which has been left by the system. So, in total, we have uh, about 17 people on the shredder. The force this industrial titan needs to apply to pound through heavy steel and grind objects into fragments sees it cannibalise one tonne of its own flesh every day. Site engineering manager David Lee choreographs the delicate balance between essential running time and self-destruction. It runs every other day, and in the days it runs, it does about 2,000 two, 2, to 2,500 tonnes of scrap. And then we do the next day, we stockpile, because we find that's the most efficient way to run the shredder. On the days the shredder's off, there's a lot of cleaning. We've then got to repair any rips in belts. And the basic trouble you have with a shredder, whenever it's running, it's basically eating itself. So the, the steel inside is wearing away. So when it's stopped, you then go replace the steel you've worn away in the day when it's running. By the time the ship arrives, the mighty shredder will consume three tons of its own metallic organs. A dedicated team of engineers cope with this self-mutilation. To produce the highly prized metal nuggets so sought after across the world, the shredder needs raw materials. Thousands of tons of it. There is plenty of scrap to choose from. On a daily basis, Americans use enough steel to run a pipeline from New York to Los Angeles and back again. That's almost 8,000 kilometers. Trucks arrive with more scrap, destined for the Evdoxia. But there is a bottleneck. This waste isn't cleared for entry until they pass the site's radiation barrier. It has never happened at Newport, but accidental hazardous waste can get through even the most stringent of checks. The two towers you can see behind me are radiation detectors. And their job is to ensure that any material coming onto site, be it by the lorries or the rail freight, is completely and utterly free of any radioactive material. Traces of radiation are found in the most innocent of objects, like hospital waste. This category of refuse isn't sent to a general recycling centre, but there is always a risk of accidental contamination. The consequences would be devastating. Evacuation followed by weeks of decontamination. The checks are clear and the truck drivers weigh in. The companies delivering the scrap are paid by the tonne for their cargoes. This simple weigh-in and weigh-out system calculates the amount on board, triggering the payments. But radiation isn't the only potential danger lurking in rubbish. Scrap cars have some surprises of their own. Cars have a useful life of about 13 and a half years. Many will live longer. But those that don't are scrapped. 
European law demands that 85% of every scrap car needs to be recycled, from the metals to the tyres, and even the engine oil, coolant and fuel. The end-of-life vehicle team at Newport has this dissection process mastered to surgical precision. First, the car is made safe. The battery is removed and a special remote control unit connected, which detonates the airbags and seatbelt pretensioners, rendering them harmless. Three, two, one. Things aren't always this straightforward. Removing the battery from a car that's been damaged in an accident calls for a little innovation. Approximately 75% of the average car is metal and 2% is liquid. A selection of specialised tools sets to work in removing these fluids. is the most recycled consumer product in the world. In just one year, the number of recycled cars would cause a traffic jam circling the earth more than one and three quarter times. Recycling isn't the sole reason for dismantling scrap vehicles. Some of the components and liquids in vehicles would be hazardous if they entered the environment. Just one litre of oil could contaminate 100 litres of water. This punch is made from brass, so it doesn't spark and cause an explosion when it hits the fuel tank. Four thousand cars a year are stripped at this recycling centre, but that's less than a day's rations for its shredder. The high-tech gut of this metal-chomping monster can digest 450 cars every hour. To satisfy its voracious appetite, tens of thousands more cleansed vehicles are shipped in from all over Britain, from a network of scrapyards and end-of-life vehicle centres. Quality control is everything. Even the tiniest amount of combustible liquid will burst into flames and shut down operations. If fire were to spread, the site would be evacuated and the stockpile of scrap rendered entirely worthless. The contaminant is removed and the site is cleared in seconds. It's a well-rehearsed safety drill. Someone's once prized possession is reduced to little more than a husk. But 80% of its component parts will go on to live again in another form. Maybe even a new car. Recycling isn't complete until new products are created from the reclaimed materials. The stripped cars are thrown to the ravenous beast. In just two minutes, the shredder turns this vehicle to a pile of shrapnel. The conveyor belt feeds its victims into the gaping mouth of the shredder. Immediately, two giant feed rollers flatten the shining goodies, ready for annihilation. Moments later, these massive rolling hammers, each one weighing almost half a tonne, smash the elongated metal against a grid, turning familiar objects to anonymous fragments smaller than a man's fist in seconds. An overband magnet separates the ferrous from the non-ferrous metal. Ferrous metal is magnetic, like steel and iron, 
The rest includes aluminium or copper. Inside the belly of the machine, giant wind turbines draw away any non-metallic objects like foam or cloth left over from car seats. Eddy current separators use alternating magnetic fields to sort the non-ferrous metals. The nuggets travel to the picking shed. Here, any cloth or plastic still in the mix is removed, leaving only the scrap metal. These prized nuggets are melted to become new consumer goods, like car parts, washing machines or fridges. Making products from recycled steel takes over 70% less energy than producing them from raw materials. The processes hidden underneath the shredder's thick metal skin turn everyday trash into some of the highest quality ferrous product called frag in the world and it gets added to stockpiles on the dockside. We're producing about two million tonnes of steel and ferrous metals out of the UK alone. Ferrous metals are found in a range of objects, from washing machines to tin food cans. And we get through a huge number of those. Each household throws away at least one tin can every single day. Worldwide, about 630 steel cans get recycled every second. That's enough in an average year to stretch a line of cans to the moon and back three times. These are big numbers, and recycling on every level is making a huge difference to the environment. It takes the same amount of energy to make one can from aluminium ore as it takes to make 20 cans from recycled aluminium. It's Friday evening. The shredder is losing its race against time. And there isn't enough frag to fill the ship. The Evdoxia is leaving London tomorrow. The shredder has just 24 hours to make up the difference. Everyone is worried about the stresses on the machinery. There isn't another machine like this in the world. If the shredder blows apart, they haven't a safety net. And if it fails its challenge, the demurrage, or penalty, will wipe any profit off this load. We're at stock at the moment on the dock. We've got about 20,000 ton. Uh, the shredder will be producing again tomorrow, so we should get about 2,000 ton off the shredder. Obviously, that's got to be transshipped onto the dock. Uh, there's also a stockpile in the far corner, which we've also got to move down, which is going to be another two to 3,000 ton. Uh, that should then, in theory, give us enough to complete the ship. If things go wrong, then the ship goes back, and we miss a tide, and again, we fall into demurrage. The shredder itself will have to work all day tomorrow. Uh, they'll start running at 7, and they'll finish at about 6, 7 o'clock, once all the stockpile is gone. Fingers crossed. But their luck doesn't hold. Only a few hours into the shift, and their worst fears are realized. With a blast of released pressure, the shredder grinds to a complete halt. The shredder lays silent as its engineers work on the problem. They can only hope their combined experience of this monster leads them quickly to the fault. The Evdoxia arrives soon. Elsewhere on the site, recycling continues. Specialist sheds deal with poison-infused waste unpalatable to the shredder. 
humans can't compete with the quantity produced by the mega machine. But they step up operations in an attempt to help with the crisis. Over five million tonnes of hazardous waste is produced every year in England and Wales, including 2.5 million fridges. All household fridges contain CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, as a coolant. These chemicals threaten the Earth's ozone layer. Here, world-leading technology works to remove these hazards and fragmentize the leftovers. Fridge plant is 750,000 fridges a year currently being processed through it, but it can handle up to a million fridges a year. It's been designed to capture the ozone-depleting substances which are present in older fridges. The CFCs are in the fridge's foam insulation and the liquid in its cooling system. The liquid is drained and the fridge is gutted of anything that would harm the machinery, like mercury switches and glass. Then, their journey to destruction begins. Eight at a time, the fridges rise up the conveyor belt towards the blender. A nightmare version of the familiar kitchen appliance this blender uses two heavy steel chains rotating at high speed to smash the fridges to pieces. In just four minutes, eight fully sized fridges are reduced to a mix of dust and metal chippings. Any CFC contaminated foam still in this mixture breaks down to around two millimeters. Perfect for falling through the holes in the giant metal sieve. The CFCs from this plant are destroyed by incineration at extreme temperatures. Stripped of their poisons, the small particles of shattered fridges continue to a field of electromagnets that sorts the iron and steel from the rest. The amount of steel recycled from each fridge weighs around 40 kilos. More and more household goods are being replaced rather than repaired each year. And metal isn't the only reusable commodity. Recycled plastics and glass also account for major environmental savings. Over 100 million tonnes of plastic is used every year. That's 20 times more than 50 years ago. Its manufacture takes 8% of the world's oil production. Yet only 7% of this widely used commodity is recycled. It's common to switch TVs or computers for new ones before they reach their sell-by date. These icons of modern living can't be thrown in the rubbish. Their chemical and mechanical contents are lethal to the environment. So, a specialised process is in place to deal with them. This shed dismantles 60,000 TVs and monitors every month. But it's a drop in the waste electrical ocean. Around 2 million TVs and 2 million computers are thrown away in England alone each year. Each TV and monitor is individually dissected. A machine sorts the leaded and unleaded glass. The plastics are separated and the internal workings of each machine extracted. Over a million tonnes of electrical items are trashed in the UK every year. That's the equivalent weight of 2,500 jumbo jets. Ten years ago, this waste was destined for landfill. Now, everything is recycled. Back at the shredder, the engineers battle to patch up the wounded machine in time for the imminent arrival of the ship. 
They have isolated the fault. There is a damaged ram, but the fix isn't easy. These giant rams maneuver the massive feed rollers inside the shredder. It can't operate without them. The biggest trouble you find with this shredder is everything's so big. Wear plates in a similar shredder, they both have like 150 kilograms. In this shredder, they have two or 300 kilograms. The hammers, uh, the ones in similar, a smaller shredder, 187 kilograms. These are about 400. It's just the sheer size and bulk of everything. The ship will arrive in 48 hours, whether the shredder is working or not. And there just isn't enough scrap on the docks. There is at least a day's work to process the remaining metal. The engineers will have to work all night to stay on track. Within moments of starting the repair, things get much worse. One of the pins securing the ram in place has buckled and is jammed in position. It's stuck halfway. Even the age-old hit it with a hammer trick isn't helping. The engineers create a bracket to fix onto the end. It will act as a grasp so they can use a hydraulic pump to force the pin out. A relatively simple job has become a feat of mechanical engineering and ingenuity. But the bracket doesn't work. Extreme problems call for extreme measures. They have one final option. To cut through the jutted section of the pin and manoeuvre the rest out of position. But this pin is 150 millimetres thick. Even the best cutting tools will be maxed out on this job. It's a risk. They may find themselves with an even bigger problem than they started with. Elsewhere, Preparation for the rapidly approaching ship continues. This 600-tonne giant crane hangs 40 metres above the ground from a 25-metre-high strut sitting tentatively over the water's edge. The claw alone weighs in at a hefty 10 tonnes, and it can lift 10 tonnes each grab placing its handful accurately into any waiting ship. Each scoop of metal is worth a staggering 4,000 US dollars. That's a lot of money for a pile of rubbish. The crews know where the ship's cargo holds will sit when she draws into dock. They distribute the metal along the dockside in line with these holds, to help speed up the loading. Some of the scrap needs more careful attention. This is as high as these piles of metal borings can get. Any higher and they combust because the density of the material causes a fire starting friction. Larger heavy items like railway track and heating boilers are dismantled by hand using a cutting torch. It's hot and time-consuming work.
4 a.m. on Saturday morning. The engineers reach the end of the pin. In just a few moments, they will know if their gamble has paid off. The shredder must be working by 7 a.m. and work flat out for the entire day to meet the deadline. The shredder is built on an enormous scale and its toolbox is specially designed and created just for this job. The cutting has worked. The pin can finally be pushed out. They quickly remove the faulty ram and fit the new one. Everything is securely in place, but they won't know whether the repair has been successful until they switch on. The shredder is back in action but it will be a full-on shift to make up the loads. Working flat out, this 150-metre-long giant of industry will reduce 350 tonnes of metal to scrap in an hour. But with such a new part working under such extreme pressures, anything could happen. The engineers remain on standby. We haven't got much time, but at full power, this machine can destroy 450 cars an hour. That's 90 tonnes of shaft rotating, mashing that metal up. And I think we can do it. The cost of failure is massive. The shredder will need to perform without a hitch to make up the shortfall. But there are more surprises ahead for the team. It's Sunday evening, and the deadline for the Mega Shredder has arrived. Two tugboats guide the Evdoxia into the docks. As she draws her heavy frame into position, the Shredder shatters its last load. The new part stayed the course, and the shredder has completed the shortfall. But that's only half the challenge. The Abdoxia must load her entire cargo and set sail in 72 hours, and there is still a lot to do before loading can begin. Surveyors from Sims, the ports, and the customer check the vessel and her cargo holds. She towers over the waiting frag. But the Abdoxia is only a mid-range cargo carrier. Worldwide, haulage vessels can reach staggering 100,000 tonne capacities. Measurements are taken using the marks on the side of her hull. As the freight fills her holds, she sinks further into the water and the marks disappear helping the stewards to calculate the total of the weight on board. It's like the weigh bridge for the lorries. Well, my yard supervisor plays a major role in keeping inspectors, surveyors and myself happy with the quantities and qualities being loaded on the ship. They'll all do a 12-hour shift, day and night. I start at 6, work straight through till 6 the next morning. They'll do that until uh, the ship is complete. We have a, a surveyor that works for us. Uh, he's a subcontractor. He will stay on board the ship and he will work until the ship is complete. 
Uh, there's also an inspector from Inspectorate. Uh, he's uh, an intermediate between us and the customer. Uh, he will uh, work until the ship is complete also. The surveyors give the green light. But the good news is short-lived. An unexpected call throws the schedule into disarray. The gantry crane has an electrical fault. The boom that swings out over the ship isn't locking properly, so the crane's massive claw can't reach the ship's holds. The crane company has to send its own engineers. There is no one on site qualified to make the repair. They've had to race from Bristol, over two hours away. It's a tense night, but eventually they fix the fault. The next morning, Richard assesses the impact of this delay. The ship has already been here for 18 of its scheduled 72 hours. It isn't looking good for a timed departure. We had a breakdown on the crane, which has put us back four hours. Obviously, the tide is for Thursday morning. We're up against it to meet that tide. We've just started the ship. Uh, we've got to get 27,500 ton on. Uh, there's currently only 3,000 ton on there, so timescales are tight. Each of the six cavernous cargo holds on this 188 metre long ship can carry 5,000 tonnes of frag. The doors are so heavy they have to be lifted open by the ship's onboard cranes. Loading is a delicate balance between speed and avoiding stresses on the ship's hull. We have to load it so that the ship takes on the metal, adjusts its ballast so it's always staying stable within the dock. The gantry crane drivers demonstrate their expertise. But the thought on everyone's mind is how fast the clock is ticking. The real concept is we just have to load that ship as fast as we can. And that is all, all we're trying to do on the docks. The ship's crew shares that sentiment. They want to keep to their schedule. Total time in, in the UK is very quickly. It's only the four days. The stevedores working very accurately, but very, very quickly. We can left this port only with the high water. These giant freighters skim the world, carrying a selection of cargoes from country to country. Normally we are working between uh, some Brazilian ports and uh, Morocco, Casablanca, we work in the line with sugar. One time we are going to the Baltic Sea and uh, one time we are coming at home in Ukraine in the Black Sea. And just now, coming here to the UK. 65 hours in and the stocks of frag are steadily reducing. But that still leaves thousands of tons to load and only seven hours to complete the job. Time is running out. The Abdoxia's first officer, Sergei, prepares for the long journey ahead. So we proceed from here to Mediterranean. After passing Suez Channel, 
and we are the Indian Ocean, cross the Indian Ocean to Karachi. So the voyage, 20 days, yeah, depends on the weather. These slivers of metal will be melted and reused for a range of household devices. Even in its raw state, this load of frag is worth a staggering $11 million. The last few scoops and her holds are full. The claw levels the heap of frag. The massive doors close and she is ready to go. Everyone can relax. The mighty shredder and its crew faced an almost impossible challenge. But against all the odds and a string of unlucky events, they succeeded. It's a short repose. In just a few weeks, they must meet the same targets all over again. On average, we're doing a deep sea cargo every six weeks. Once this one is finished, now we'll start preparing ready for the next one, which uh, currently will be in sort of middle of June. The deadlines are unforgiving, but they have the shredder on their side, and it has an appetite for destruction big enough to fill any waiting ship.